it is. It's, it's great to be here. Um, I am extremely impressed with the uh, <laughs> wonderful uh, lectern designed by Shibur Rabali. Collaboration <laughs> <laughs> with, with the Skyscraper Museum. Um, I thought I would, as Carol said, talk for a few minutes about uh, these two books, which, thanks to a strange accident in, in schedules, are in fact appearing at the same time and creating the illusion that I'm much more productive than I really am. Um, the books aren't the same, as you can see, although I think they do complement each other. Uh, Why Architecture Matters is an attempt to figure out what underlies a life spent thinking about and writing about architecture, to try and put into words all the things I, I guess you could say I've been taking for granted my whole, my whole life. Um, it's a relatively short book shorter than this other book, Building Up and Tearing Down, Reflections on the Age of Architecture, which is a collection of my pieces, mainly from the New Yorker and some from elsewhere. I'll say a few words in a minute about that, but first, I'll, let me just say that, um, well, since Why Architecture Matters is shorter, it, of course, took much longer to write. Um, you remember that old line about how if I had more time, I would have written you a shorter letter. Well, this, I guess, is my proof that all, all, of that is, all of that is true. I, you know, I feel a certain need to explain this book to people. Um, I'm not quite to the point of running up on the subway and grabbing people and starting to explain it, but at least in a group like this, I feel a need to explain it because it doesn't fit into most normal categories of architecture book. It is not a history, definitely. There are plenty of architectural histories extant, and many of them are very good, and I did not want to write another one. It's not a fancy coffee table book with glossy color photographs at all. Um, and so while it is not ornate enough or expensive enough to uh, decorate a coffee table, it does have a comfortable and manageable size. And it's my hope that unlike many architecture books, this one might actually therefore get read. Um, it's also not a guide to architectural styles. Uh, either. There are enough of those around, and some of them I think are actually rather good, rather better than I could do. Um, similarly, it's not an architectural dictionary. Um, my view has always been if you want to know what differentiates Georgian or classical or Gothic architecture, or what a pilaster or a pediment is, well, you know, you can always look it up. Um, I don't, in fact, always remember myself the precise difference between an architrave and an entablature. And I feel that that's what those other books, or maybe Google, are for. Mm -hmm. What this book is written for is the stuff you cannot look up. The feelings, the emotions, the personal connections that we feel toward architecture, the way it affects us. I'm sure all of you, as an architectural, sophistic, architecturally sophisticated audience, have at one time or another heard that quote from Sir Winston Churchill to the effect that we, we shape our buildings and thereafter our buildings shape us. I think why architecture matters is really at bottom an attempt to get sort of underneath that Churchill quote, figure out if indeed it is true, and if so, how and why does it work? How does it happen? What makes one thing affect us one way and another thing affect us another way? Why you might have prefer the World Trade Center and I might have preferred the Chrysler. Why you may remember your childhood bedroom with more vividness than you could describe the room you sleep in now. Why you may have recollections of a high school classroom that are more clearly defined in your mind than the office you work in now how buildings change over time, and finally, how they work together to create a larger sense of place. Anyway, it's something of a coincidence that these, these books, so as I said, were written over different periods of time, kind of came together at this moment, but I think it's a happy coincidence because they complement each other. They're both books that I hope architects will like and respect, but they were not written for architects. They were written primarily for non-architects, since I've spent most of my career 
trying to bridge the gap between a profession that is all too often incomprehensible to the public, sometimes <coughs> incomprehensible to me, uh, and, to a pub and between it and a public that cares more about how architecture shapes the world and wants to understand more about it. So the premise, I guess, is to figure out the place of architecture in the world and explain it to non-architects. I know that it matters very much to me as it obviously matters to everyone in this room. But I did not write this book to prove that architecture has saved the world. Great architecture is not bread on the table, and it is not justice in the courtroom. It affects the quality of life, obviously, and often with an astonishing degree of power. But it doesn't heal the sick, teach the ignorant, or in and of itself sustain life. At its best, it can help us to heal and to teach by creating a comfortable and uplifting environment for these things to take place in. That's but one of the ways in which architecture, though it doesn't sustain life, can give the already sustained life meaning. So when we talk about our, how architecture matters, it's important, I think, to understand the way in which it matters, beyond, of course, the obvious fact that it gives us shelter. That it's the same way in which any kind of art matters, because it makes life better. Paradoxically, it's often the most mundane architecture that means the most to us. The roof over our heads, the random buildings that protect us from the rain and give us places to work and shop and sleep and be entertained. I don't focus entirely on this kind of building in this book, but I do talk about them because I don't buy the notion that there's a clear dividing line between serious architecture and ordinary buildings. Um, early in the book, I quote Sir Nicholas Pevsner's famous line, a bicycle shed is a building, Lincoln Cathedral is architecture. <laughs> But what of it? Both are buildings and both of our, our architecture. And while Lincoln Cathedral is obviously a vastly more complex and profound work of architecture than the bicycle shed and was created with more noble aspirations, the premise of this book is that each of these buildings has at least something to say about the culture that built it, built it. each evokes certain feelings and emotions, and each is of at least some interest visually. <clears throat> There's more to say about the great cathedral than the bicycle shed, but each helps shape our environment. And it's equi the equivalence in our culture now of Pevsner's bicycle shed, the architecture of the vernacular, commercial and residential architecture of the mall, the highway strip, and the suburban town of today, we might say, certainly have a greater impact on where most people live than a cathedral. Now, I'm not saying this to be one of those politically correct critics who says that these things are of equivalent importance in our culture to more ambitious works. Merely that we ignore them at our peril. That they can be banal or they can be, and they can be ugly. And on rare occasions they can be joyful and witty, but, and it's true that they're rarely transcendent. But they still tell us a lot about who we are and about the places we want to make. And often enough, these ordinary places work pretty well. That's really the point I'm getting at in this, in this section of the book, at least. Um, that the entire environment, built environment, is in interdependent and interconnected. From freeways to gardens, from shopping malls to churches to skyscrapers and gas stations not to romanticize the landscape that surrounds us at the beginning of the 21st century, but merely to make the argument that Pevsner's academic distinction no longer holds up. Maybe it never did, but I think there probably was a time when everyday architecture seemed much closer to great architecture, and the qualitative difference between the two was not as noticeable. Yes, it's true that the Georgian Row House in London was much more modest than a great country house, a great country estate, but the two were still of a kind. They spoke the same language, and even simple slum houses seemed like stripped-down versions of the great house. 
bargain basement offerings from the same catalog, you might say. It's in 18th century London, Georgian architecture created a language, and out of that language, both ordinary buildings and masterpieces were made. If you were an architect, you understood that language well and could write in it. If you were an educated layman, you could recognize and appreciate its details. But if you lacked any knowledge at all, you could still take pleasure in the clarity and the rhythm of the building constructed in that language, and you could see the way it created a city of life and beauty. Now we obviously can, don't need to speak only of London. In 19th and early 20th century New York, the brownstones that lined the side streets and the Georgian and Renaissance-inspired apartment buildings that later lined the avenues, and even the <coughs> tenement, cramped tenements suggested a common architectural language as well. It was a language all of you in this room surely know, a language of masonry, redolent with ornament and detail, emerging from the belief that every building, no matter how private, had a public presence. It had an obligation to the street and to anyone who passed before it, whether or not they had reason to walk through its doors. The language of scale was shared by the buildings that together formed the streets of New York in, let's say, the hundred years from the mid-19th century to the mid-20th. Though the buildings were often very large, they were oriented to the pedestrian and connected to one another as elements along a street, elements of a larger whole, not primarily objects unto themselves. Now this common language reflected a respect for background, for the notion that buildings created urban fabric, and from that comes the beginning of the civilized environment. And that is not, of course, in itself a new idea. Um, I and so many other people have been making arguments like this for a long time, and it may be odd to think of the decorated cornice, say, on a Ninth Avenue tenement as a gesture of civilization. But in the cityscape of New York at the end of the 19th century, it was. The cornice engaged the eye, connected the building to its neighbors visually, and made it part of the larger composition of the street. And it suggested that a building had some purpose, <coughs> has some purpose, other than merely keeping its occupants out of the rain say that it exists in however meager, awkward, even vulgar a way to enrich the city around it. It makes gestures to you and me, even if we never have any reason to connect to it other than walking past. And that intention is what, to me, makes Pevsner's distinction less than useful today. Do we call this tenement with a nice cornice a fancy version of a bicycle shed? Or is it an earthbound echo of Lincoln Cathedral? Either way, it's an ordinary, everyday structure that someone has tried to turn into something that gives you just an instant of visual pleasure. A practical construction that is more than really practical. Now maybe that, the idea of a practical structure that is more than really practical, is as good a definition of architecture as we could come up with. Of course, by that standard, virtually every building is architecture, so long as its physical form reflects some degree of civilizing intent. Whether that intent reveals itself in something as crude as the curlicues of the tenement cornice, or as intricate and profound as the stonework of Scharf, or the space of Borromini's extraordinary Santivo in Rome still architectural intent. Anyway, the book starts out discussing some of these things and then goes on to talk about the extent to which our architecture rather is balanced precisely and precariously, I say, between art and practicality. That it is not one or the other, it is both. Architecture is art and it is not it is art and it is something more or less, as the case may be. That's its paradox and its glory. It is art and not art at once. So I go on to talk about how architecture is not like a painting or a novel or a poem. Its role is to provide shelter. 
and its reality in the physical world makes it unlike anything else you might commonly place in the realm of art. Unlike a symphony, it has to fulfill its obvious practical function, and it has to stand up. But a building is not like other things that we might place in the realm of a practical, but that may have aesthetic aspirations, like an airplane, or an automobile, or a cooking pot. But we expect it, when it succeeds aesthetically, to be capable of evoking more profound feelings than, say, a nicely designed toaster. And because architecture is always there, presenting itself to us, even when we don't seek it out or choose to be conscious of it, it makes sense to think of it in slightly different terms from, say, the way we might discuss Baroque music or Renaissance sculpture, which is to say that it makes sense to consider it not only in terms of great masterpieces, but also, to go back to my first point, in terms of everyday experience. It's part of daily life for everyone, whether or not we want it to be. You may visit Sharp Cathedral as a conscious act of intention, just the same way you might choose to read Madame Bovary or decide to hear a performance of Beethoven's Lake Quartet. <coughs> but you live your life within and around and beside dozens of other buildings, almost none of which you've chosen to be with. Some may be masterpieces and some may be awful. But while it's perfectly reasonable to talk about the meaning of literature without bringing in Daniel Steele. I'm not sure that you can grapple with the impact of architecture without bringing in Main Street. That's anyway why the premise of the book and why I've been talking so much for the last two minutes about the relationship between the ordinary and masterworks. It's not wrong to say that the greatest buildings provide the greatest moments of architectural experience. Of course they they certainly have for me. But I'm trying to set out an argument that sees architecture as not a sequential story of masterpieces, but rather a continuum of cultural expression. So, so by now it's been pretty clear, I think, that I, I see architecture in terms of experience, feelings, rather than where a building fits into the history and theory of architecture much more interested in what a building evokes in us as we walk through it or walk around it or live with it over time than anything else. This book is arranged, therefore, not chronologically, and not in terms of kinds of architecture either, building types. Uh, but rather, instead of that, it's arranged really, you could say, in terms of ways in which architecture affects us, ways in which we think about it. The chapter titles kind of make this point. The first one is called Meaning, Culture, and Symbol. The second is called Challenge and Comfort, which is about the constant tension, dialectic, in architecture between challenging us as art should and taking care of us, playing a kind of nurturing role that art does not have to do. <coughs> then architecture as object, which starts with the premise that we have to admit that whatever else a building is, it's also a thing a physical object in the real world, in the physical world, and how it looks and performs as an object still counts for a lot. And then architecture as space, <coughs> which is obviously because the crafting of space is the greatest achievement of many architects and the most important aspect of many buildings that needs to be discussed and experienced as a thing unto itself. And then architecture and memory, which is actually one of my favorite parts of this book, in part because it's the most personal. It talks about how each of us has our own formative memories of architecture, whether from childhood or adolescence or young adulthood, and how we also have a shared cultural memory of architecture, established through films and literature and art, and how the personal and those shared memories play off against each other constantly. My first memories of architecture were, now I admit my deepest, darkest secret of growing up in New Jersey. <laughs> uh, but I, I know that the town in which I grew up in actually did play a significant role in establishing my own, my sense of things. Uh, not just the house I grew up in, but the whole town, but then of course, far more so, New York. 
And after that comes a chapter called Buildings and Time, which is not the same as architecture and memory. This one is about how buildings themselves change over time, and so do our attitudes about them. In this section, I talk quite a lot about historic preservation and about how so many buildings aren't understood in their own times, and even less in the times immediately thereafter. It often takes a generation or more for a building to find its proper place. And even then, future generations will see things differently. And there's a wonderful line from Sir John Somerset that I quote in this book. It says, I think it is, the fate of every work, great work of architecture to be hated before it is ultimately understood. Um, one of the best examples, in fact, is, which is discussed in the book, is um, the uh, Art and Architecture Building now Paul Rudolph Hall at Yale, which I'm sure most of you know, glass and concrete, brutalist building that was finished in 1963. It was briefly the hottest building in the country. It was sort of the Bilbao of its time, you might say. And then it fell from favor, rejected as too harsh and too tough and too unforgiving. It was accorded so little respect that it was repeatedly trashed and altered badly so it began to look less and less like its architect had intended it to be. And then more recently, it was seen through the softer and more forgiving lens of history and restored quite beautifully. And in fact, when it opened last year, it was, looked better than I think it ever had. And you realize it was never quite as soft, as tough and mean as it was reputed to have been. And anyway, so this, this chapter discusses the the changing attitudes toward buildings over time, and also how um, within preservation, we once had a sort of level of expectation that if a building was torn down, it could be replaced by something equally good, and how in fact some of our most beloved landmarks in this city were replaced, replaced buildings that were perhaps equally good and discusses the challenge of how do we keep this going and not lose <coughs> the city while still protecting all that we treasure. The book ends with a chapter called Buildings in the Making of Place, which is pretty obvious, I guess, what that is about, about architecture, foreground and background, and architecture making context, and context making architecture. Uh, it makes the somewhat sacrilegious point for an architecture critic, which is to say that if I've learned anything in all my years of looking at buildings, it's that in a town or a city or even a village, the street matters more than the building. So that, in summary, is, is, is this book. It tries to make the argument that architecture is about the making of place and the making of memory. That it gives us joy if we're lucky. And it gives us satisfaction and comfort, but also connects us to our neighbors, since architecture in a town or a city is the physical expression of, common, of the idea of common ground. And in an age when so many of our contacts and encounters are virtual, when architecture is a constant reminder of the urgency and the meaning of, and the value of the real. So it, tries to make an argument then that buildings are not simply inanimate objects, but are in fact occasions for and shapers of humans, but are in fact occasions for and shapers of human contact. Let me now shift gears and uh, talk for another couple of minutes before we open up to discussion about building up and tearing down in this other book, which, as Carol said, is a collection of critical essays, mostly from the New Yorker. Um, you know, Lord Byron once wrote that one might as soon seek roses in December, ice in June, hope constancy in wind or corn in chaff, believe a woman or an epitaph before you trust a critic. <laughs> well, there you are. I would like to think, sexism notwithstanding, that. Byron was really thinking about literary critics, but even so, the point is clear that the critic is a complainer, a naysayer, or perhaps even less admirable, a flatterer. But either way, whether he praises or complains, is not a figure 
who either creates real work or makes a significant contribution to the dialogue, neither architect nor historian nor theoretician. But while we're in the mode of quoting from eminent literary figures on criticism, let me add Matthew Arnold, who defined criticism as a disinterested endeavor to learn and propagate the best that is known and thought in the world, a line I somewhat prefer to Byron. I think that actually gets to the heart and point of criticism, which has to have something, to, some connection to an educational role, building the aesthetic sensibility of readers. In fact, if it didn't sound hopelessly pompous, I would say that the purpose of criticism in the general media is to create a better educated, more critically aware, more visually literate constituency for architecture and thus presumably increase society's demand for good design. Now, I don't want to sound hopelessly pompous, so I would say that. But at the end of the day, I think that notion does have a certain amount of truth. It's not the only reason people like me do what we do, but it's a big part of it. And while it's important not to get carried away with your own importance and believe you're there to provide enlightenment for the unenlightened masses, it's equally important to remember that a substantial part of what a critic does is educate. If you believe in education and you believe in what we might call visual literacy, and you believe that there is some way in which design can make the quality of life better and the quality of community better, then you have to believe that's at least part of the reason design and criticism exists and why it's essential that the profession not talk only to itself. So a certain part of a critic's job is to provide a kind of bridge between the public and the profession, but maybe bridge is an altogether wrong analogy because it implies open passage in both directions, and of course the critic should not be doing that. Everything is not worthy of advocacy, and the critic has to be a filter of ideas, has to exercise some judgment. If a critic is not exercising judgment, there is very little point. In a wise critic, I think, judgment is tempered by enthusiasm. And both judgment and enthusiasm, I think, are ways of expressing love. And a critic who doesn't love his field or her field cannot last long enough. To love the thing, and also to love what it means in other people's lives, and not only your own, is, I think, a further prerequisite to functioning as at least a journalistic critic. I don't think that's inconsistent with exercising judgment. In fact, I think they go hand in hand. Judgment and education, both parts of the critic's role as a kind of interpreter, communicating his or her love of things, and in so doing, instilling some love in others. Now, I realize this is getting to sound a little bit touchy-feely and maybe a little soft in the head. Um, it certainly feels distant from any idea that the point of this realm of journalism is to be tough and judgmental and to expose the wretchedness of 99% of what gets built in this country, not to mention to expose the rampant inequities of redevelopment schemes and the horrendous lack of a housing policy in this country or the failure of planners in so many places to create a viable public realm today. Well, yes, and the critic who is only an enthusiast risks being seen like Browning's Duchess is too soon made glad, too easily impressed. <laughs> and in fact, as I look back on what I've done in New Yorker over the last few years, I think several of the negative pieces I did, like on the Western Hotel at Times Square by Architect Hanukkah, which the editors gave the memorable headline of is this the ugliest building in New York? <laughs> <laughs> or the Astor Place condominiums by Guacme Siegel, or the Prada store in Soho by Rem Coolhouse, which I compared unfavorably to the Toys R Us of Times Square. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I think all of these have had at least as much impact as any positive pieces I've written. Mm -hmm. um, now, because the New Yorker does not, as a matter of policy, try to cover everything, because we're selective both for reasons of editorial judgment and limited space. We 
the decision to write a negative piece has a special weight, I guess you could say. We need to believe that there's something important enough to justify giving a building one of the few precious slots in the magazine each year for an essay on architecture. After all, we can always simply ignore a building since we ignore most of them anyway. Mm -hmm. so if we, but if we pass on buildings, then it's not to avoid saying anything negative. It's usually because they don't present any significant issues that can inspire an interesting and provocative short essay. You know, I wrote about that Astor Place building not to be critical of Charlie Glossley, who was an architect who I generally admired, but to make a point about the glib and the superficial modernist work that was now being done by developers in the condo market, the way in which architecture had been conscript conscripted into the process of marketing. And similar, the Western Hotel piece, I guess, had a similar notion, which was to inquire into what constitutes vulgarity. Um, and again, about the way in which architects with serious design intentions can become compromised by the commercial development <coughs> process. So too, with the long series of pieces on Ground Zero that I did that ultimately became the basis for another book, Up From Zero, Politics, Architecture, and the Rebuilding of New York, that was published a few years ago. Uh, those are not in this book since they did become the basis for another book, but I'll just say a tiny word about it because it's hard not to when we're just a block or two away. Um, the compromising of design intentions was, of course, the central part of the story here too, uh, but in a much broader context. Social issues, political, architectural, and cultural all came together to ask the question of how much architecture could do, should do. How much should art, could be expected of architecture in terms of healing society's wounds? Was architecture, was society expecting too much of architecture? Or was architecture expecting too much of itself? This is not the time to talk about this subject, but, um, or to really answer those questions. But suffice it to say that when I wrote that book in 2004, I ended it on a note of ambiguity, since despite all the problems, it seemed as if things could go either way. And I had a sense of cautious optimism that we might, in fact, be able to produce a plausible if flawed architectural response to the conflicting demands of commemorating horrendous tragedy and loss of life and renewing and revitalizing the city. When I wrote a new chapter to bring the second edition up to date in 2005, the tone was far more negative and the process had grown only more political and less promising. And now, a few years after that, I look at that afterward that was added to the second edition, and I think, why was I so positive? <laughs> <laughs> Things have only gotten worse by far. And there we are. I, there is one essay about Ground Zero that was written after the book that is in this new book, but nothing, nothing from, from that period. Um, Anyway, you know, I've not spoken in the last few minutes very much about ideology or theory, which is intentional. I think a key difference between an architect and a critic, or a theoretician and a critic, is that the former has a right, even an obligation, to proceed from a theoretical viewpoint. And no such obligation exists for a critic. In fact, the opposite may even be true, that a critic shouldn't believe that there is one right way to do things. That belief that there is one correct solution to a problem strengthens the work of an architect, and it enables the thinking of the theorist. You don't want an architect who sees too many ways to go, and sees validity in half a dozen different approaches and does not feel a passionate drive toward one of them. But that same worldview can weaken the work of the critic, who needs to proceed, I think, from a more pluralist viewpoint at least nominally, or he forfeits the ability to explain and interpret and judge the wide range of work that is likely to come in front of him. But a critic has to stand for something, obviously. He can't proceed from the idea that anything is acceptable as long as it's done well. So how do you combine the absence of a narrow and rigid ideology 
with some guiding principles? I think the answer lies in the difference between what we might call social or moral or ethical issues in aesthetic or the recognition of a difference between social and political responsibility and issues of aesthetic choice. A critic can and should establish a set of social and political principles that define his or her judgment and act as a foundation for criticism. And the challenge is to hold on to these principles and at the same time to remain open to a broader range of aesthetic responses, of different aesthetic responses to them and be able to judge them on their own terms. So I, I do believe and argue in, in this book that architecture exists in it, inevitably must exist in a social and political context and has to be judged within that context. So finally, let me, let me come back to the question of the effect that architecture has on quality of life. You know, for a long time, critics yearn for an age when people pay attention to architecture, when society cared about it. Well, beware of what you wish for, as they say, <laughs> for it's what we've got. It's not by accident that the subtitle of building up and tearing down is reflections on the age of architecture. The age, not an age of architecture. We've gotten our wish. We've been wallowing in architecture, or at least we were, until the economy crashed. But even before the music stopped, we were beginning to learn the painful truth, which is that lots of wonderful buildings by talented architects do not, in and of themselves, bring us to the promised land. If we once expected too little of architecture, I fear that today we've been expecting too much of it. It's worth remembering if I can repeat something I said just a few minutes ago, talking about why architecture matters. But Architecture does not cure cancer, and it does not put bread on the table. It's not justice in the courtroom or peace on the battlefield. If there's anything that architecture critics and journalists need to be mindful of today, it's that architecture does not solve all of our problems. It doesn't sustain life. But it can make the already sustained life much more meaningful, much more pleasurable. And it's the critic's job think, to observe and encourage and support that process in any way you can. So that's what I've tried to do in both of these two books, each in a somewhat different, different way. Um, one literally through criticism and one through stepping back and kind of looking at uh, really how, how my eye has been working all these years trying to figure it out, which, uh, and in the hope that that would in itself mean something to people um, in terms of looking, looking at buildings. Um, the genesis, by the way, of, of why architecture matters was in a book uh, that was supposed to be called How to Look at Buildings. And I wrote about half of it several years ago, and then never finished it. I told you I was going to put an end to any illusion that I was really so productive. Um, it sat around for a while while I worked on other projects, and I just couldn't quite figure out what I wanted to say about it. And uh, uh, then uh, I was approached by uh, Yale University Press, which was starting a series that they call Why X Matters, which are sort of arguments about why a field, an issue, a thing sort of is important that we're intended for, I guess you could say, educated lay people. And they asked me if I would write Why Architecture Matters, and I said, I would love to if you think this half-finished book could be the beginning of it. And so they read it, and they liked it, and so um, I picked it up and finally finished it. But its origins was in, were in literally about looking at things, and I've tried to keep that as a theme all the way through. Um, so, uh, anyway, uh, rather than conclude this on some uh, great and uh, impassioned note, I would rather uh, stop at that point and open this up and uh, turn this into a 
conversation that we can all be part of. So I'm happy to, happy to take questions.